that he's been doing this I mean he's, he's an old timer in this community you've been around now since the 70s uh, talking about free energy talking about open source talking about the fact that we need to get experiments that we can you know start replicating and start actually you know getting uh, some measurements to and uh, Jeff's doing that man this is what it's all about so I'm just so excited about that and I'm really pumped <laughs> to bring up the next speaker uh, and I was I just have to share a story with you I my mission this week was to bring two people in contact with each other, and that happened this weekend. Uh, Dr. Gerald Pollack, who, whose absolutely amazing uh, presentation here yesterday afternoon, uh, I just I went I had to change the schedule about three times to make sure that his presentation wasn't at the same time conflicting with uh, Dr. King, and uh, and we made that happen. So Dr. King got to see Gerald Pollack yesterday, and Gerald Pollack got to see the, uh, most of your presentation yesterday over at Tesla Tech. So anyway, I'm just delighted to bring up to you um, our next speaker, Dr. Maury King from Tesla Tech. Come on up. Greg for inviting me here today, and uh, I was just thrilled to, to meet a number of you and, and, just, and just hear the conversations. Uh, it's an effervescent intelligence. I'm, I'm drunk on, 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 on your ideas. Every, uh, there's such creativity that, uh, um, gee, I want to give you guys an applause. <laughs> it was terrific. Um, what, I, what I've put together is, um, I'm an engineer. I started, uh, I was an electrical engineer, became a systems engineer uh, back in 1974. We had the, the oil crisis and all the gasoline lines. I coincidentally had a roommate who was in the general relativity, he had that big book by Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler, Gravitation. In the back of the book, last two chapters were discussions of zero point energy. It was Wheeler's theory of geometric dynamics. And I went, holy cow, he was talking about fluctuations of electromagnetic field energy with extraordinary energy densities. It was down to the Planck length, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's 20 orders magnitude below the electrons. And I went, holy cow, here I am in graduate school in engineering, and I've never heard of it. And so I approached my engineering professors in the engineering school, not one heard of it. And I go, gee, why didn't you tell the engineers, uh, the physicists knew about it, so I went over, and sure enough, I met some physics uh, professors and things like that, and I thought, well, I'm gonna start up, up again. So here, I finished my coursework, my PhD in systems engineering, and I'm jumping in to uh, graduate physics and quantum mechanics and things like that, and people say, you, are you crazy? You're, you're, that's all complicated stuff. Why are you doing that? And I said, well, why to learn it, right? To see where, where they're at. And sure enough, the physicists were stuck too. They knew that the energy was existing, and I asked the obvious question, can, can we possibly tap it as an energy source? And they go, oh no, no, uh, it's, it's random, it's chaotic, uh, it's, the law of entropy says you can't do it. They had a model like, like a heat bath, where everything is independent. And as I looked at the theories of the zero point energy, I said, wow, how could it possibly be tapped as a source? And, and then in 1977, like just in the nick of time, uh, Ilya Prigogine wins the Nobel Prize um, in, um, in, in chemistry, but it was the system theory Nobel Prize on how a system may evolve from chaos to self-organization. And I go, wow, and it required certain conditions of the system. And um, those conditions were, it had to be nonlinear, far from equilibrium, had to have some type of energy flux through it. And it turned out that the zero point energy theories of Wheeler, Wheeler in particular describes an energy flux of, of the zero point energy flux, fit the theories of Pringagine. And here I was get, I wanted to get my thesis in systems engineering, and, and Pringagine was a systems engineer. And sure enough, I studied that work, uh, the whole bank of work in self-organization, and, and there's journals on it, on system engineering, and I said, I would apply those theories to the zero point energy. And everybody was shocked. None of my professors wanted to deal with it. They didn't know about it, but they, but they knew me, and they were good sports in some cases. But just then, 1979, I get invited out to Iring in Utah. They were interested in pursuing some of the experimental work, 
And thus, that's where I stayed ever since. I'm We're sorry. almost there. I'm so sorry. But, but the good news is I'll be able to go through the slides quicker because I'm yeah. telling you the information on the slide. Give them an extra five minutes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So, so um, then, of course, I agree with this. You, you can't get your thesis unless there's an experiment. And of course, you have to prove this. this is out of the paradigm. It's not belief. Uh, and, there, and then what I'm going to share with you very rapidly are slides of of what I consider some of the best of the experiments that show that self-organization is occurring with the zero-point energy interacting typically with plasmas and new work this year show it possibly interacts during water cavitation and so we'll be looking at some of those experiments very quickly excellent and so uh, these these conglomerates involve charge clusters plasmoids uh, the cavitation bubble, especially the reentrant jet being emitted from the cavitation bubble. And if this is really true, the implications are that large vortices of plasma uh, likewise cause entrainment in the zero point energy and creates a, a coherence in it, actually ends up grabbing a net energy gain out of it. And typically in plasmas, we don't see it because we're not looking for it. It's out of the paradigm, it's forbidden to be looked for in standard academia. Uh, but so the inventors typically stumble across it by doing the right stuff. Okay, could you pour me a glass of water? Absolutely, yes. Is Bottom it? button. Uh, typically throughout the history of science, probably since Newton, there was a belief that in an ether. Maxwell's equations was an ether theory. It was typically hydrodynamic in nature. The vocabulary, thank you of electrodynamics and uh, vocabulary of uh, Maxwell's equations are basically uh, fluid dynamics, fluxes, things like that. They have source sink models. Uh, it was very nice. So, it, but in 1905, uh, the Michelson and Morley experiment comes along, Einstein's theory of relativity comes along, and it's, it's very elegant as it, as it unifies the electric field with the magnetic field. And everybody threw out the ether. But they only measured the wind of a static ether. Um, not, but Dayton Miller furthered the work of Michelson Morley. He worked with Michelson on the, on the interferometer experiment. He made an interferometer 10 times larger. It was 10 times more sensitive. He did experiments on Mount Wilson. At ground level, he got approximately the same result as Michelson and Morley did, but on Mount Wilson, he got uh, evidence for an ether drag theory. As uh, James DeMeo uh, wrote a wonderful paper, it's, on, it's up on the way. By the way, you don't have to take notes because I want to tell you at the end how to get all these slides, and at the bottom of every slide is a reference, and you'll get this slideshow and yesterday's slideshow from one website. So along comes in 1930, uh, quantum mechanics comes into play. The vacuum now is a, a, a surging sea of fluctuations, electromagnetic field fluctuations. It gives rise to the uncertainty principle, and it gives rise to pair production, a production of uh, electron-positron pairs popping out of the turbulent vacuum. And it says, there's my first evidence of self-organization in the vacuum. So look what we have. We have a gap in science, 25 year gap from 1905 to 1930. Where it is believed, because of the Michelson Moore experiment, that empty space is empty. Prior to that, we believed in an ether, and after that, we believed in the fluctuating vacuum, which, by the way, is a much better model for an energetic substrate, because it's modeled more like a turbulent plasma in the, at the microscopic domain or at the Planck domain. Therefore, but this 25-year gap has dominated the belief of, of all of science. Everything you learn in school, the vacuum's empty, especially the engineers. And the engineers are the guys that do the stuff. They want to see real stuff. So I, when I was at last year's conference um, back in Washington with a lot of engineers from NASA, I still couldn't get any traction with it. Their beliefs just block them. They think the physicists that believe in this stuff, oh, they're just kooks too, with the Big Bang and all that stuff. They dismiss them. The engineers, truly in their beliefs, say the vacuum is effectively empty, and I will ignore all ideas associated with tapping it. 
Uh, if you go to the literature, it's well open question what can be done with the vacuum energy theory. Uh, in the beginning, Blair was the leading proponent in the United States, and he wrote uh, a series of papers that culminated in that all quantum effects can be described as by matter's interaction with the vacuum energy. Uh, the hydrogen ion could be modeled and put off a uh, team with Heche and others uh, to show how the hydrogen atom can be modeled from the vacuum energy. It can be an energy source without violating thermodynamics. Very important paper because when people say it'll violate thermodynamics, the experts say no. It's an open question. You've got to prove it by an experiment. Uh, how gravity can rise from it as well. And probably the most exciting paper is how inertia is sourced in the vacuum fluctuations, meaning all the elementary particles are intertwined with it. And if you can start to create a technology that controls the vacuum, you can create propulsion of a sort that we can go, undergo abrupt accelerations without feeling inertial stress. The model in Wheeler's geomicrodynamics was essentially a turbulent plasma with electric flux entering and immediately leaving uh, R3 space uh, called uh, quantum foam is what he called it. The flux through any hole, a little mini white hole, uh, was on the order of uh, the calculator from general relativity, about 10 to the 93rd uh, grams per centimeter. Um, that, it's more like, it's probably infinite. That was just a general relativity calculation based on squeezing it off uh, like a black hole calculation. So what it is evidence is an electric flux, a flux of of energy from a higher dimensional space. So can self-organization occur? Everybody said no, it violates entropy. And then Pringajian wins the Nobel Prize for saying no, under certain circumstances it can self-organize, and those circumstances have to be nonlinear, far from equilibrium with the energy flux, and that was Wheeler's model. The energy flux is coming from a higher dimensional space. It enters and leaves. If there's vorticity in the flux on the right, it forms the elementary particles. It's like the particles of the whirlpool. They constantly need to be fed by the stream, and the uh, all the, uh, they just and the whirlpool needs the flux to continue always. And the pace of time is associated with the flux. If there is slight tilt to it, we call it vacuum, vacuum polarization. And if the energy comes through incoherently, that's just the background of vacuum fluctuations. This is the orthogonal flux model of zero point energy. It's basically John Wheeler's model. Uh, Robert Laughlin sees the same thing. He won the Nobel Prize. He wrote this book, uh, Inventing Physics from uh, the Bottom Down, a Different Universe. His point of view is everything arises from collectives, including the laws of physics themselves. The principles for coherent zero point energy just do what Pringsheen said to do. Work with a highly nonlinear system like plasma, abruptly drive it far from equilibrium, abrupt pulsing, uh, maximize the interaction with the zero point energy, typically using the ions and creating vortex forms. Electron clouds make very few, uh, electrons make a poor transducer to affect the vacuum energy. The electron cloud in a conductor is, sim is essentially in thermodynamic equilibrium with them. You don't really get much in the way of vacuum activity with normal electrical circuits. However, the ions, the nuclei, have steep lines of converging vacuum polarization. And so any abrupt movement of the ions then starts to kick up the zero point energy. They see it in the accelerator experiments they call it exotic coherent vacuum states. They see it in the plasma ion acoustic mode where the ions are moving synchronously together. The plasma ion acoustic mode is, is, is famous for manifesting energetic anomalies. The anomalies simple, often center around a self-organizational vent like a toroid. And they see large radiant energy absorption, high frequency spikes, runaway electrons, anomalous plasma heating. And you're seeing it in the plasma experiment. Um, a type of cluster that's, that's unusual is the inert gas clusters. And, that, and in them, they can do laser excitation of a mixture of inert gases. When they, when they make the cluster, they get anomalous release of energy. So this, this inert gas cluster is, is like an exomer. It's in a kind of a cold plasma state and can be re-excited re to release the energy. Uh, they see their structure to it. So these are the, st the standard 
journals where they're making this observation, typically with laser excitation. And that can be used to help explain the PAP engine, which was running on in a mixture of inertial gases that had to be conditioned by exciting it in, in a, in with lots and lots of sparking before they fed it into the engine. Um, a tip, the typical form, formation of self-organization you see in the plasma is called the plasmoid. It's essentially a vortex ring. Uh, around the ring uh, is a self, uh, is a force-free vortex and it naturally wants to stabilize in this form. And uh, it's like the tip of the vortex connects to the other side and keeps it stable in the vortex ring. Uh, Ken's shoulders launches tiny ones with a known charge on a capacitor, a small capacitor. They're all the size of a micron. He realizes they are the, these clusters uh, can travel on the dielectric, hit a witness plate, and um, create craters and, and damage high melting point ceramics. And he knows that that's, uh, uh, there's excess energy from these experiments because he knows how much energy you put on the capacitor. It's very small. The important thing was abruptness in the discharge and getting a liquid melt on the tip of the electrode. If observed, they have the equivalent charge of 10 to the 11th electrons, 100,000 ions. The, the mass, the charge to mass ratio typically always center and it becomes what the uh, electron is. The typical is the charge to mass ratio of the electron, and they contain excessive energy. They can form into chains, which is unusual because they're, they're different charges, but we heard uh, from Dr. Pollock's talk how in the media, Right, uh, like charge things can attract as long as uh, there's there's positive ions in between that cause the attraction. Um, the positive EV is very significant. He didn't make very many of those, but he noticed likewise their charge to mass ratio was like the positron, but they were not. It was not comprised of positrons. So he can believes, and I think he's on track with this that he is onto the essence of what it is to make a pair, make a particle from the vacuum itself, from the substrate. He, I think he's hitting on the nature of what's going on in pair production, except at a macroscopic level. We're on the order of a micron here. Uh, he sees pairs he see in his experiments. They call them dual EVs. EV stands for electron molybdenum, uh, stood for strong charge. He later called them EVOs for exotic vacuum object. Once he was convinced, he was tapping into the vacuum energy as part of this self-organized conglomerate. The black EV, after he makes them, they can go dark. And he doesn't see them, but they're sitting on the substrate and a small electric pulse brings them back to life. And he started emitting light again. His biggest energy anomaly was create a water vortex, a small water vortex through a hole and shoot one of these EV through, through the hole. He said that that was such a powerful pulse he could not find any way to tap it. And he wanted to share this information with Peter Grineau, um, uh, because this was the best of the, ele of the ele uh, exploding electrical discharges in water experiments. Peter Grineau is famous for doing that. Peter uh, did photograph a plasmoid form in high-speed photography and was creating anomalous energy, anomalous force. And this experiment is the best. The only problem is, he can't find a way to tap the energy. That energy is so concentrated, it damages anything it hits. The analogy he used was like shooting a, a bullet at a windmill blade. Terrible um, impedance mismatch. So here's a summary of the charge cluster anomalies. They adhere to dielectrics. They can clump together. They bore holes in the high melting point ceramics. He says that it disrupts the electron bonds is not by heat. The energy the energy's there coherently. It causes the electron bonds just to let go. And then as they fall back to the ground state of, of the material, then, then that's when the heat gets produced. Uh, and also claims of element transmutation and radioactivity reduction. So when we transmute elements, that's our strongest evidence. There's something really energetically strange and anomalous going on, and strong evidence for vacuum energy coherence. So we looked at experiments where people are claiming element transmutation for clues. Ken Shoulders was doing it, but it's, uh, at low energies, he, he presented the, the work at the Cold Fusion Conference number 10, and he would get nucleosynthesis across the periodic table, not just moving one nucleus over to an adjacent nucleus. He would get this bizarre result. He's not the only one. 
out of Manko in the Ukraine with the Proton 21 laboratory probably they have the best transmutation experiments on, on the planet. They make a very pure, pure ta target of copper. They hit it with a plasmoid, a big plasmoid, about a centimeters in size, and they create supernucleosynthesis. I, they call it super because it's like a supernova, a, what a supernova does. They're getting transmutation and production of uh, elements all over the periodic table. They have professors hired to study this. They create new theories of the nucleus, trying to explain it. Yet, this work is completely ignored in the West. They have a conference nearly every year on ball lightning and cold nuclear transportation to study this effect. It's well repeated, and it's a shame we won't look at it because we have the quark model, and the Nobel Prizes have been given out. And this strongly implies there is more to a nucleus than the quark model. Uh, the, and then the big, the most probably the most spectacular thing was was that I learned was this year on. Mark Leclerc's claim of maybe creating transmutation with habitation bubbles. Uh, what he did was here's an assembly, it's a very simple experiment. He's the first beefy pump, that's a 25 mile per gallon swimming pool pump. He rolls up aluminum veer, it has many decorative holes in it. The holes are very important, puts it in the pipe, here's it assembled, and there is where he starts the pump with the input valve on the right. So the experimental setup looks like this. He uh, has a water bucket a couple feet below, so it can help pull, create cavitation bubbles. He starves that pump down to about a half a gallon per minute. The pump emits a loud squeal. He's constantly adjusting the valve to keep it at uh, that uh, acoustical range, around five to seven megahertz, just to keep that squeal going, right? And he warns, he says, uh-oh, he gave himself uh, the uh, illness of symptoms like radiation poisoning because he sat too close to it for half an hour or an hour as he was constantly fiddling with the valve to, to, to do this experiment. Nonetheless, when he rolls out the aluminum veneer, he's getting a ton of elements. That white blotch is carbon in the diamond form. He, he's used laboratories to do the analysis. Uh, they have nucleosynthesis, once again, all over the periodic table. Unusual isotopes were measured. And he noticed that they were multiples of the helium nucleus. And he says, wow, this is just like what happens in supernova experiments. So the big action item, what well, Mark wants and why it came forth, is replication for this. It's an easy experiment, just warns protect, shield the shield yourself from it, or work the valve remotely, and, and repeat this experiment. If this, this is probably our strongest evidence, if we can get it that easily, it changes the world. So what Mark discovered that we have a collapsing cavitation bubble near a, near a surface. It emits the reentrant jet. This is standard uh, hydrodynamics. They know that. In the reentrant jet, there's incredible pressures, and this is where we're, we're building. Under those pressures, like over 300,000 psi, a new form of water appears. It, uh, it's a macroionic water crystal, simply formed from the severe pressures that, that takes us up into solid state pressures. All of it concentrated in the tip of the reentrant jet. We're at the nanoscale here on that tip. All the energy of that collapsing bubble went into making the reentrant jet. And when that jet hits any surface, it dam damages it. What, what Mark learned to do was shoot it through a hole. And then, then it builds up a head of steam, and then it hits the next plate over, and then it creates the transmutation. So the, having the holes were important. Uh, here's a model of the water crystal, or the uh, and at the tip of the crystal is what he calls the plasma shock wave, and that's where he believes the zero point energy coherence is occurring. And what struck me, uh, that's the same thing as shoulders EVs, the same thing on that tip. And the same anomalies are observed, cutting through trenches, through high melting point ceramics like aluminum oxide. Uh, the structure has a linear chain of uh, OH molecules, um, or o isomers of water, but it's in a linear form in the solid state crystal. Chris Eckman, who presented at the MPA, there's a paper on him uh, in 2010, uh, found evidence in Brown's gas measurements of linear isomer of water. And so if that chain 
from close into a ring uh, to be stable under perhaps a hundred uh, half a micron. And if to stabilize it, it has to be a form of Rydberg matter where the electrons are up at the d orbitals. You have you have energy stored in a coherent fashion down in a microscopic water bubble or water crystal ring that when it's ignited converts into a, an EV plasmoid. Right? So we have a connection between Mark Leclerc's discovery of this water ring and the EV, meaning that in these Brown's gas experiments, this could be the storage mechanism where we could actually get energy stored in this form of water that we can reuse later. And my first talk over at, um, yesterday was on this very topic and that all the slides, and they're annotated with the speaker's comments, can be downloaded from the same website that you'll download these slides from, and you'll have all the information of yesterday's talk uh, written there. So therefore, the similarity between Ken Scholler's EV's discovery and, and um, Mark Leclerc's discovery, the, the anomalies were so um, similar that we, we now have, the, I believe we're dealing with the same phenomena. And it's a miracle, it's an absolutely miracle that we could actually store it in water in that way. And all these anomalies around these Brown's gas electrolyzers can explain, be explained by that component. If we get a lot of these entities uh, circulating, we can create coherence by vortex action. Uh, the Beltrami vortex, we credit Don Reed, our audience, now let's give Don a round of applause. He's been doing work since the 70s on this. I, I think he's been terrific as far as... I, I like to acknowledge my references when they're in the audience. Go <laughs> back. So if I just did a, the force free vortex, he showed a lot of the Beltrami vortex, got done up, dug up a ton of support for, for this idea. But basically the curl is in the, the vector is in the same direction as, as the vector. And likewise, it's magnetic field. It's a natural form. Plasmas want to organize this way. They do pair production in the plasmas. Type of turbulent plasmas launch pairs, counter-rotating pairs of vortices in the plasma. It's just like pair production in the vacuum. Excuse me. Oh, we have these filaments, vortex filaments that can go into higher order filaments. And you can see structure upon structure and self-organization being built up out of a turbulent substrate. Uh, likewise, the clothes and the plasmoids. Uh, we can look for anomalies and, and tornadoes. And they're essentially, you can see, they're essentially plasma entities. And we've had these guys last year with you, thunderbolts. Uh, the sun, right? All sorts of plasma filaments across the sunspot. Look at that. They have a filament that breaches across the sunspot. That's over 600 miles long as a plasma vortex. All that could be coherent in zero plane energy. The corona of the sun could be, could, could be coherent. Right? Galaxies could be coherent, right? Any vortex form of plasma has the opportunity to cohere the energy. So that could be a dark matter explanation. Who knows? Uh, we can make technologies. Lots of free energy machines were invented around this principle. Uh, Schauberg is the most famous. He gets this anomaly with a, a vortex, a uh, water jet turbine. People were saying it's over unity and things like that. Of course, nobody believes him. And then Wells, with a similar thing, using a working fluid of cooking oil, uh, uh, did the same thing. Very similar turbine, presumably being a self-running device. Uh, one of the later ones of this last decade was was the uh, vortex implosion device by Haskell, who teamed with Ron Rockwell, Rockwell. And you could uh, read about it. I think this was earlier. It wasn't this last decade. And there's a great essay on the Panacea site, how they went wrong. Some of the best of the energy devices, I didn't know about a lot of them, of the last 10 years, they, they mentioned in, in this essay. Everybody, they had very big effects. All of them got suppressed. So basically, there you are. This is Don Lee's contribution. That the Beltrami vortex in the plasma is the self-organizing principle. It is the key to unlocking the vacuum. 
We see it over and over again in the ions, uh, inert gas clusters. We have the charged water gas clusters associated with Brown's gas. And if you can take any of these clusters and further circulate them in a bigger vortex, you can get a further entrainment perhaps. And you can start trying ideas like this, taking the Brown's gas, dissolving the water, and then making vortexes out of the water. Four degrees comes from Schauberger, this is the highest density of water. And um, keep building up the energy coherence. So vortices then could entrain the vacuum energy. It could be that simple. That's the miracle. So basically, the zero point energy and the self organization coming from Pringigine's work uh, create the energetic clusters of plasmoids or inert gas, uh, the EVs, and now the cavitation reentry jets can have it at the tip of those reentry jets in the, in the water crystal. And then making larger form vortices of plasma and, and the, the various implosion technologies. So the real key to changing the world is share the information, get it up on the web and it would make a new world. Thank you. It's Let me uh, it's from it's my, I have some books over the years. Essentially, these books were collections of my presentations. Uh, this book was the most requested presentation because the name, T. Henry Moray, made an energy machine that nobody could explain. Uh, and my first name is coincidentally the same as his last name. So it's quite a bit of synchronicity. And here's the website where you can get both of these PowerPoint presentations, yesterday's and today's, as well as all my PowerPoint presentations that I presented on the water topic. And all you have to do is Google water, fuel, ZPE. The first hit will be the PezWiki site. And just tell people to Google that, and the information's up for, uh, with all the references for everyone to share. I think we're going to forego questions because I want everybody to be back here at one o'clock so we can start on time. But thank you so much. I, I just have to add one thing: is that you think that water ring idea has any connection with the e the EZ zone? I mean, because he's talking about the organization taking place in the EZ. That's what hit me. Is, do you think there's a is, is there a location to this this water ring, or is it throughout the whole bulb? Yeah, we have we have. Uh, yes, is the answer. We have water self organizing. What, what Mark discovered, under this, the extreme pressures that he found, he got it self-organized into a solid state form, as opposed to just a liquid form. And it's very short-lived unless we can get a ring. And on yesterday's slideshow, I showed various means where we can produce the small rings. And the miracle is if, those, if it's really true, uh, then, then you have your proof. You have your proof. We're tapping into some extraordinary energy. Um, if you don't like the zero point energy, come up with something else. Very cool. I'm sorry, I asked a question. I said there weren't going to be. Yeah, but, all right, let's, let's break for lunch, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you at the one o'clock.